We've all got scars, some on the outside and some on the inside, but we can't be defined by our scars. I've spoken with some extraordinary people about how they become empowered by their scars. This is I've Got Scars, baby. So I am really excited about this show today because we have an amazing guest on the show. Um, I love how you just you just meet people and you're like, I wasn't even, you know, I was just doing other stuff. And then you just kind of fall across and tumble across somebody. And then they're like, yeah, so I do amazing things and help the world. And I'm like, wait a minute. So... So that is the case today with Dr. Tony Johnson. He is an educator, speaker, and a community advocate. And so I'm so excited to speak with you today. First of all, you got the business background. I see you over there all business. Listen, you, 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 you like you like all Hollywood and stuff. So I said I got to at least try to make you proud. So let me let me try well, to get my back. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it so much. I do. So, yes. So, you know, you and I had a conversation and you shared with me your story. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. You know, because on this show, I really love to 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 talk about because everybody doesn't get born and in, in, into a situation with like a silver spoon in their mouth. Some people have some challenges that they've, you know, they didn't necessarily ask for, but they are able to move through those challenges and Absolutely. become successful. And you have that kind of story. And so I wanted you to share your story with us. You know, what, what, what was going on? Okay. I can do that. First, I want to say thank you so very much for having me on your show. I think you do absolutely amazing work. Um, I think having folks who are professionals talk in a very authentic space about we, we haven't had a perfect life, don't have a perfect life today. Um, it's just so meaningful. So thank you. Thank you. I'm so humble for this opportunity. Um, I grew up in uh, South Florida um, in you know, a difficult situation. My mother was adopted, um, so she never knew who her uh, birth parents were. Um, she, uh, we were uh, pretty much low income and she wasn't kind of treated like the other people in the family mm -hmm. either. So it kind of felt like she was adopted out of the philanthropic good thing to do, but she never was kind of fully embraced as a full member of, of the family. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, had, and she also was a team parent too as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, she uh, was a team parent with what I would say low self-esteem because of how she was treated. But what I, I always tell her was so amazing about her is even with the, the baggage she had, she was so committed to treat me differently. She was like, I'm going to make sure my son has everything. I'm going to make sure he always feels loved. And, and she was always encouraging throughout my entire childhood, even to today. Uh, hey, mom. Um, so she, uh, so um, I grew up where uh, a lot of violence, every time I was walking home from school, I was recruited by the drug dealers to uh, become a, mm. uh, a little street uh, drug dealer. So I had to walk through them to my pathway uh, home every day after school. Um, violent, violent high school and middle school uh, uh, shootings. I mean, I know running from bullets uh, just many days during school and after school, razor blade cuts in the face. I mean, just all kinds of stuff you see with the wow. inner city of schools. Like that's the school okay. I went to. Wow. Um, but I, and my mom worked two jobs. Um, so I was just always so committed to try to make it better for her and for us as a family. So mm -hmm. I really studied hard because my goal was I can help us to, to, to get out of here uh, yeah. or at least try to. Um, mm -hmm. So, but in terms of the traumas, I think I have many of the traumas that so many of us have had, um, whether it's, I was really skinny back then. I ain't really skinny no more because mm -hmm. I was, you know, and I'm short, so I'm about five foot eight now, but I was like, you know, a buck 10. Uh, so being mm -hmm. a real little man, you know, I didn't have the deepest voice in America either. So a lot mm -hmm. of those things kind of played into my feeling of self um, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and seeing all this violence in my neighborhood uh, as well. And, just, and also being mistreated uh, too by a lot of adults uh, in my neighborhood uh, as well. So uh, it's a lot of those uh, traumas uh, really um, affected me. Uh, my, you saw abuse um, in your household as well. 
Yes. So my father was very abusive um, to uh, my mother. Um, she was only with him two years after I was born, mm -hmm. um, but she did suffer a lot of abuse from him um, prior to my birth and, and shortly uh, thereafter. But my birth, she said, was her turning point where she felt it wasn't just her, um, but she had a, a bigger calling to ensure the house was safe because she had a son now. So uh, when I was two years old, she packed up all of what she could on her back um, in a backpack and put me on her hip and, and walked to probably about five miles from where she was living to her parents' house in the middle of the night um, because she just said she just didn't want to see her son grow up in an abusive um, household like that. Um, when I was um, two, before she left him, uh, she came home one night uh, and he, he, no, actually, I'll take that back. She left him and he uh, was hiding in the bushes of her, her parents' house oh and jumped God. out with a two by four and just attacked her terribly while I was holding her hand. Now, of course, oh. I don't remember this. I was two, um, yeah. but she uh, told me the story. So she, and he beat her unconscious and she had to be rushed to the emergency room. Um, but, you know, like the good old people from the South, I got a praying mother. Oh, uh, so she she definitely made it uh, through that, um, and and I'm just I'm just so proud of her always. Uh, and she she's never been in an abusive relationship after that. She definitely um, <laughs> made herself a priority uh, from okay. that. And I think that's the thing about people, right? Like yeah. we can we can do one or two things with traumas. We can let those traumas haunt us for the rest of our lives, or yeah. we can use them to encourage us to be resilient yeah. and move past that situation. Now I know it's easier to say, oh just be resilient forget that stuff but as you know uh -huh. already Ms. Bryant, it's easier said than done right yeah. it's a lot of internal work you have to do a lot of um soul searching um, depending on where people are your spiritual spectrum you know and that kind of stuff so it's just a lot of a lot of stuff but that's the first question so let me not keep carrying on so <laughs> now okay. see no that's that's heavy and that's real and i you know and i'm glad that you said that it, it really is easier said than done because trauma like if we understand epigenetics if we understand how trauma it it does it attaches itself to us and our mindset and different things and and it just gets in us and so there is a lot of work to do and i love that you said that your mom has never been in a in a physically abusive relationship after that because she started to love on herself so it sounds like she started to heal those wounds within herself that even connected her with an abusive relationship so that she started to love on herself. So you, you dropped a lot of jewels in there. And I think that's so important for people to hear. So as, as a man growing up in that kind of environment, a young boy, young, young, young man, how did that shape your view of of women, of men, the role of men, um, because today we're talking about identifying trauma in young black men. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is what we're going to talk about. That's a really, really big topic. And I know this is something that you've experienced in your mm -hmm. life. So how did that shape the way your view of your mom, women, the role of men in your life? Like, how did that shape you? Ooh. Now that's a loaded one there. Um, so it, so one, I was um, confused about every every household in my family was ran by a woman. So yeah. the man had either died, he was incarcerated, or he left her. Mm -hmm. So uh, every woman, like every woman, was it was the woman was leading the house. She was the head of house in every. So for me, I I, I didn't know like. What, what's going to happen to me when I become of age to have a family? Because it seems like all of the men are absent um, when it comes that time. And then I, I kind of, I think I would say, started to develop some self-hate in that when I hear the women talk about men, it was very negative, yeah. you know, about how they, they left them and and now they got kids and, and responsibilities and, and, fi and finances and how hard it is. Mm -hmm. So I think I developed a self-hate because I was like, this is kind of what my life is going to become too. And I couldn't figure out like if this is what it was destined to be, if this was life choices. But uh, one thing for certain that I knew at a very early age was try to do well in school. That, like, that was my thing. Like, I don't know. So for me, 
I, I never thought I would go to college. Like right now, I'm a holder of four degrees that I earned, right? But for me, I was, this was my goal. My goal was I want to do really well in school. I want to take the, the city test to get a maintenance job because that was the good job. That was, you got benefits. You were on the back of the city truck. You cleaned up the streets. Like where I'm from, that that's like, that's like the epitome of you've done well. So mm -hmm. although I was in honors courses, I had a 3.5 GPA, like it wasn't about college for me. It was about, I want to do well on that test so that mm -hmm. I can become a maintenance guy so that I can help put money uh, in the household uh, for my mom and myself. Um, so um, it took one or two teachers kind of talking to me about, no, you need to get on the college trajectory. And I was like, we ain't got money for that. Like we just me and yeah. my mother, we're just trying to make it at this point. Like, yeah. so, so they started talking to me about financial aid and things like that. And I also, you know, think about as a black man, I didn't think I was smart enough, right? So although my GPAs mm -hmm. reflected as such, I didn't speak with the King's English. I had mm -hmm. two gold caps that had BMW on it because I thought that was cool. I had a little earring. So, I mean, for me, I, I, I had a perception of what intelligence looked like and I didn't look like that. I didn't look like that and I didn't sound like that. So... Um, one of my uh, most amazing uh, teachers, and we are Facebook friends to this day, Miss mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie Nagel said, kid, you're going to college. She's like, I don't care what you say, you're going to college. Mm -hmm. um, and she just really pushed me, uh, encouraged me, yelled at me, and I just started applying to college. And I got mm -hmm. um, accepted to uh, my first uh, three choices that I applied to. Um, and then from there, it, you know, I just saw that if you work hard in school and, and try to keep your head head down the focus, you, you can matriculate and get through it. So degree after degree, I just kept going. <laughs> so that's kind of wow. what happened there. Yeah. Wow. Gosh. So what do you feel like education did for you? Because you said that you, you had some insecurities because you didn't fit the mold, so to speak. So what did education do for you? It changed my whole life trajectory. Um, I mean, I I really took the standardized assessment seriously that we took in school. You know, the one you take once a year yeah. to see where folks are. I, I didn't know that the third grade one was the high stakes one, kind of that determine your trajectory. Um, in, uh, in do you know about the third grade assessment? If not, I can. No, please elaborate. Actually, oh, oh I, I will. So, okay, everybody should know this. In the third grade, the so every year students take a high stakes assessment in all of the states right mm -hmm. to see where kids are and, and where kids are comparable to other children in the state mm -hmm. but the third grade assessment is the one that sets the trajectory of if that child will be general education path to elementary middle and high school or if they're going to go college preparatory elementary middle and high school mm -hmm. or if they're going to be referred to special education so wow. it is so important that how a child performs on that third grade assessment. So mm -hmm. kids who um, really be very lackadaisical about it can end up being um, labeled as a special education student if they perform um, bad day, don't take the test serious. So there's a lot of factors and a lot of debates over the decades about that third grade assessment. But that third grade assessment is also used by the prison system to determine the amount of prisons that will be built. And you know who those prisons are built for. Yeah. Folks that look like me and you, right? Wow. In particular, if it look like me. Um, and so they use those third grade assessments as economic planning for prison expansion efforts because they have found there's a direct correlation between those who are not educated and criminality. And I know you know this. Yeah. Uh, but that, but in short, that third grade assessment. So I knocked the third grade assessment out of the park, not because I was trying to prove something to myself. I just knew that I needed to do well in school because I need to get a good city job one day. Um, yeah. So when I did, I did um, so well that after the scores came back mid year, they pulled me out of my um, regular third grade class and moved me to an advanced uh, third grade class. Uh, so then when I went to middle school, I was in the honors courses yeah. and then in high school honors courses as well. So that whole trajectory of college prep, but it it is um, happy that it happened, but it also saddens me of how many people who did not have those opportunities mm -hmm. But I mean, in the third grade, I mean, how seriously can you can you take a, a test, take things? Right? Yeah, unless somebody teaches you and they kind of groom you to look at school like that. But you 
or looking at it like that because you had to be serious because you had to help your mom in your mind. You're like, I have to get us out of this life. So I have to be great. And that's a lot of pressure for a third grader Mm -hmm. to even think that, but, and to feel that, but, but at the same time, it sets you up for success. So Wow. So when you got into college and your college experience, did that help with your self-esteem? Did you start to see yourself differently? What was it like for you? Honestly, I would say undergrad didn't, not at all. Um, I went to a P- PWI as well, so that didn't help. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, because yeah. they were offering the, the most money is kind of why I ended up there. I wanted to go to yeah. HBCU, but I, yeah. know, I needed the funds and PWI was, was, was given it. But definitely shout out to HBCUs, folks. So don't, don't take this the wrong way. That, that's that's where my money goes in investments. All right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I ended up at PWI, Florida State University. Um, but of course, being 13% there out of 50,000 students, you know, African-American students, you know, there's not a, a strong sense of community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to say it wasn't until really graduate school that um, I really started to feel like I bought a Mercedes. Like life was like, was moving in a fast track that I never even kind of dreamed of. Like I, I ain't got a Mercedes anymore, y'all. So don't get excited. So, <laughs> but I bought a Mercedes. I had a good job working on the sec- the third degree. I mean, things were. I think I just had to step back and have an internal discussion with myself. Like Tony, chill out. Like you, you really, you're doing well. Like you're doing good. Like yeah. you're not the 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 guy back in the hood who didn't know what's going on with life like mm-hmm. people like open doors for you now to walk in like you you speak in front of large groups so I kind of had to have an internal conversation with myself mm-hmm. because I think as you know Miss Bryant we get so stuck sometimes with where we were mm-hmm. and what, what we don't have and the assets we don't have and I don't mean yeah. assets by tangible you know yeah. Yes. And I think I was, my mind was so stuck there that I had to, to, to internally recalibrate, like that's not yes. where you are. But what I, I love about myself mm-hmm. is that uh, I, I am a very uh, humble man because I know that kid who was 110 pounds, who was so scared to walk through those drug dealers every day, yeah. who had to run from gunshots. Yeah. Who, uh, mom cried oftentimes because she had to make the decision on should I pay the electric bill or buy groceries and, and those those tough decisions and she never and I want to put this out she never pressured me to 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 do well in school or, or to any of any of that or, yeah. so she she just just loved on me right yeah. but for me I just know how much she poured into it mm-hmm. and that's the kind of thing I want to message to other black men out there there are so many sisters out there whether it's their mother their aunt their cousin or somebody who who is really trying their hardest to support yeah. and, it, and to me we gotta want to do better we gotta want to not make it so that these um, loving women and there's single fathers out there too. So I'll give y'all brothers a shout out to and uncles and others who and mentors. But we gotta not have them to support us our whole lives. We gotta get to a point where we're gonna go and get education. It doesn't have to be formal college education. It can be a certification or something so we can take care of ourselves and help take care of people who took care of us. Absolutely. And thank you so much for saying that. It, I, I truly I truly, truly believe that. And also, I want to add that because of what we in, as African Americans have experienced in this country, I also want men to know like things have been shifted in a way. I think it is natural for the man to want to do the help and to help and to do all these things and to take care and to all of that. But from slavery, women have had to protect our men because we wanted to keep them alive. Absolutely. And so over time, that all, that starts to reinforce in a man's spirit, like, oh, I can't go do those things. There's that glass ceiling energy. You know, these different things, I can't go out or something bad's going to happen. So there are a lot of times cultured in, into feeling like they can't 
go out and have, you know, and take on the world and be amazing and so on and so forth. And so I, you know, I want men to understand that, hey, we got to, it's just a mind. We got to shift the mind. And you, a lot of times you've just been raised to feel like it just can't happen, mm-hmm. but we ain't going to do that anymore. Absolutely. <laughs> we, Absolutely. we, we move, we are shifting, Absolutely. changing all of that, clearing that out because as women, we do need you. And I want men to hear that, like your presence as a man is so necessary you are so necessary, man. Please understand. We love you, need you. Um, a woman feels safe in your presence. We are in our feminine energy in your presence. And oh my goodness. So I, I you know, that's a whole other topic, but I just had to say it. I just had Absolutely. to say it. So people, in case the men are watching, like understand. Right. Yes, we want you to step up and do amazing things. And we also understand, too, why it has been difficult in the past for men to do that. But it's a new day and we're going to do some new stuff because we need each other. OK, all right. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. All right. That's true. I if, I can, if I can dovetail on here really quickly. <laughs> yes. That, um, women have to be have have been forced to be super strong. Black women, but particularly mm-hmm. the black women, women of color been forced to be super strong but like you say that's that they didn't i don't think that's the inherent goal or interest no nope. but when the man is gone and you have bills to pay children to raise and got to get a career in your, like these are what things you got that to do. for us to do but yep. i i think that that we as black men have to want to do better and do better and i think we need to work with each other because mm-hmm. there's so much distrust us black men have with each other that is so disappointing to me like for instance if there are several of us who didn't go um to college and we're trying to figure out let's start a lawn service like four but let's get come on let's let's do this thing let's yeah. start a painting service you know yeah. all, all we got to do is get one little license we all put a pool our money together get a license get a truck and let's go. You know, so it's that kind of stuff that I really want us to work together because this whole capitalism, you know, try to get up there to, to the top the best way you can by you yourself. Know. Absolutely. But we had a disadvantage because mm-hmm. this this whole society structure has never been structured for us. So mm-hmm. we need to be entrepreneurial, but we got to trust and want to work with each other. Yeah. You know, let, let things happen. And I, exactly. And I and I and I love that you said that and I feel like it really comes a down to a lot of the scars that we have, the trauma that we have. When you are put in situations where you see a lot of violence, you see, you know, your community suffering on a consistent basis, there's a part of you that checks out and feels like it's just not possible. So I think this kind of conversation and your story, your experience is something that can actually help people to see there's another side to this. Absolutely. So I love it. So right now, what is the work that you are doing with youth? You are a community advocate. You are an educator and a speaker. What are the things that you are doing in the community now uh, that you know is really very much based on your previous experience growing up? Mm-hmm. Sure. Thank you. So I have two companies uh, that I lead. One is called Captivate Perspectives. Um, and the other is called the Institute for Lifelong Learning and Workforce Innovation. Um, and in those, uh, I, we provide workforce uh, training, um, and education supports for both young people and adults, and we do some project and program management work. Um, I would say most of the work that I've been involved in has been centered on, on Black and Brown um, people, because that's what my passion is. Um, I feel like... Uh, I feel like we 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 owe it to our community to help our community. Um, so to the extent that, um, and I'm also involved in 100 Black Men uh, as well. Um, I'm a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. So I'm in a lot of different kind of Black mentoring um, mm-hmm. groups uh, as well. Um, and I think it's just it's, it's just critically important. And I think um, it is so exciting. I'm mentoring. I mentor a lot of um, young men, but I'm a couple of young women too. But there's a, a, a young man, he gets so excited. When he's on the Zoom, he just brightens up before I even open my mouth. And, and that, that's just, just so warm to my heart because it's, it's like what you said, Ms. Bryant. My presence means so much that he's beaming from ear to ear before the evening. It still says connecting and it comes in his face and he just. He's like, 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and I just and I just love it. Uh, I just love it because uh, what I what I I'm not going to commit to is to be um, the absent man like my father was. Right, yeah. was always in prison, and when he was out, he was up to some foolishness. Right. Yeah. So I think even if it's black men who uh, do not have children, you definitely got um, a responsibility because there's so many of you that can be, and you got some time on your hands, right? Mm -hmm. that, should, that should mentor um, and do more work in our communities. And for Black men with children, I mean, the civil rights movement and before, we got such a big commitment to our to our communities. We got a, a lot of work to do, uh, whether that's uh, mentoring kids oh, and to the, the point of single mothers. I mean, they need us. Single mothers are trying to make this happen with one child or multiple children, even mm -hmm. if that's, and I'm going to tell you a couple of things. I, 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 well, one thing I think I've done, I want to talk over the time, but I have attended, I have volunteered with single mothers to go to their parent conference with them. And 100% of the time, they have always accepted my invitation. And at the end of that parent conference, they are elated, crying, and thankful because I'm in that parent conference as if I am the parent of that child. And I'm asking them questions. I want the right people in there. I want the teacher in there. I want the coordinator in there. I want the assistant principal. So, and we doing a very much a drill down to see what is going on and what supports the school is having, what we can do at home. But I, that's something that um, don't cost a dime. I just got to drive my car over to the school. But that's the stuff that we need to do because some parents don't know how to advocate for their sons. Yeah. They don't know the right question. They want to, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't know the right questions to ask. They don't know how far to push. Um, sometimes sisters get real mad and shut down in, at the mm -hmm. store. So there's a lot of things with both of us being present that yeah. has made the world a difference. So I, gosh, I love that. And, and can, I have to say this. If we understood, I think if we fully understood the principles of balance, masculine and feminine energy, and while being a single mom, I'm not, you know, I'm not a single mom because I, I can't speak on that, but I, you know, my parents divorced when I was two, so I was raised by my mom, and, you know, my dad was still in my life and all of that. But I saw my mom as a single mom working two and three jobs. And there is a level of exhaustion that happens. I'm just being honest. You know, I've seen it. I've experienced it as, as the child watching. And it's one of those things where there's an energy balance. And sometimes guys are just really good at just, hey, we just need that to be right there. Put that right there. And everything's cool. The woman, it takes way more energy. It's like, OK. Wait, we might need to put the, okay, you know, like there's a little bit, I'm not saying that. everybody's different. So I'm not trying to say that everybody is the same and that women are discombobulated, but I'm saying something that a man might be really great at, and it takes minimal effort to just say that right there is something that a woman may not be so great at, and it takes extra effort and vice versa. So I just want to say that there's a, there people who are complimenting each other's energy. So if anybody ever says, oh, I don't need you, whatever, mm -hmm. the balance is necessary. So I just want people to understand the balance is good. And, and there's a reason that we're different from one another because each, each of us have, you know, we complement one another. So Absolutely. I'm very, very, very happy to hear that. And we probably gonna have to have a whole other show on how to enroll other men into doing all that good mm -hmm. stuff. Like, Absolutely. let's make it happen. But so so what I would like to ask, mm -hmm. just in your opinion, okay. how do you think, because I, I want to get into the minds of these young men, the trauma a young man experiences okay. outside of just the community around him that he goes out and looks at out, mm -hmm. you know, out the front door. What other influences whether it be media, social media, what other influences do you think really keep a young man kind of in a box and keep him just on maybe, you know, not believing in himself, not necessarily taking, you know, being interested in going to the next level or knowing he can go to another level in his life? What do you think those things consist of? 
I think uh, media um, plays a very, very significant role in how young black males perceive their assets their, and their deficits. Um, I think that there is um, a couple of standards that media has portrayed of what a black man looks like. And for mm -hmm. young black men, if they feel like they depart from what that, that visual representation is, uh, they feel that they're less than. Um, and I think that is something that is so, so difficult to champion over because media is everywhere, right? It's, yeah. It's so what are, what are some of those things? Can you name a couple things that people, that young mm -hmm. men might think, oh, I need to be this in order to be a man? Um, I think that physically fit has taken on a whole uh, another level and physically fit is important for yeah. health reasons. Yeah. But I think media has shown physically fit being more about the aesthetics of what it looks yeah. like rather than the importance of your longevity of life and health. Mm -hmm. So um, you see these men with these ripped up abs, no shirt on, you know, and just in looking to have the, their own yachts, they're having a, the best life, whether it's a, a ball player, uh, uh, these fitness uh, instructors are taking up my timeline everywhere. Um, so they've got a vision, well, I got a stomach I'll, and I'm short and I'm not even talking. So I think their, their image of self, wow. fit, what they're seeing and this man has the great life. He has uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the great, the great woman. He got the, the yacht. He got the money. He got this. He got he got um, twenty four thousand likes under the page. You know, and all this stuff. Um, so I think it's, it's still the image of who we are. I think the 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 um, drug dealer image has changed a little bit. I think the media to more the hustler image. Mm -hmm. So I, it could be like uh, um, a red solo cup, which is indicative that it's a drug mix in the cup with mm -hmm. a stack of money in the hand. But it's all the things like a black man and criminality is um, is 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 a is a if you don't look like that, like where where do you fit in that mix? Mm -hmm. And then I think another um, image because of a lot of um, the liberating of the black man is the uh, effeminate um, close to cross-dresser look of mm -hmm. a black man too. But there's so many different images of black maleness yeah. between, outside of them three um, yeah. that it makes, I think, a young black man kind of confused to kind of where he fits and, mm -hmm. where, and how he can be accepted. And one of the things that I do uh, presentations at conferences about in terms of black males, is that's two things, that, well, a lot of things, but these are two of, of some of the, one I say to teachers and those that support them is I say they're young. They're young. So don't, don't indict them on doing things that aren't um, smart choices right now. They're young. You were young too at some point. Mm -hmm. And so I said, while they're young, nurture them, sow seeds into them. And, and, and continue to sow as many seeds while they're with you. And I said, because there are so many positive stories that'll come back years later when they'll come and say, uh, Miss Weatherstone, thank you so much. I know I was an off the chain seventh grader and I never highly come to class and dropped out, but now I'm amazing. I'm doing this. And so I say, don't, don't get caught up in who they are today but do continue to love on them, continue to support them, continue to give them knowledge. Cause you know, black males too have a pr protectiveness too, right? Where it appear to be aloof and not, not here, like quiet mm -hmm. and just staring at you and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but I say they, they're still a young person. I don't care how they act. They're a young person. Yeah. So as much as you knew or didn't know at 14, that's all they know and don't know at 14 too, or 12 or whatever age, right? Yeah. So I try to uh, really uh, kind of push that um, uh, quite a bit too. But I think that um, young males are very confused about so many things. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, sexual molestation is 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 no more on the rise than it has been before, but it's always silent in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of males who, because um, I've talked to some males where their um, their older siblings have gotten out of jail and have molested them, and they haven't, oh. of course, said anything to their family. And they're now in their 50s now, you know. Wow. So there's so much of that, too, that I also think impacts mm -hmm. a Black male's uh, view of himself in his community. And I also think the last thing on this topic is, um, like when you say the male female energy balance, which is so yeah. I'm so glad you say that. They're gonna they're gonna go off the hook on the on YouTube about that, but they'll be okay. Um, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> You're right. You are absolutely right. Yeah. And the other piece I was gonna say on that too is just that the um, it, it is um, how a black female accepts or not accepts a black male as he's young also mm -hmm. impacts him mm -hmm. too tremendously. 
Mm-hmm. So if mm-hmm. the girls say, oh, he ain't cute, girl. Or, uh-uh, he too short. Or, uh-uh, he, his boy saying, you know, so I think all of those mm-hmm. negative images, and I'm not saying that all um, African-American women do that, but, you know, African-American uh, women and all women have certain preferences, right? And certain mm-hmm. looks that, they, that mm-hmm. they go for. And I think to the extent that some black males depart from that um, really has an impact on how he views himself. Wow. Ooh, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot because you think, I think generally speaking, and I'll say this as a, as a woman and as a woman who is a burn survivor as well, you want to fit in. Right. Nobody wants to stand out. Not typically. If you're a very special person, if you're like, yay, I love being different than everybody else. I'm like, wow, you are a unicorn. Mm-hmm. But usually if for some particular reason, say you're like, you're, you're the, the young black man and your community is as it is, you know, people, you see a lot of hustlers or whatever growing up but you like sci-fi and you like to read, Mm -hmm. you're going to feel weird. You're going to probably feel as weird as I feel felt growing up with a big old scar on my chest and shoulder and not feeling like a woman. You know what I'm saying? So anybody, any young man watching, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm I'm a woman, so I can't speak to you as a man, but I can speak as a person who has felt different and didn't ask to feel different. You know, I was burned at 18 months old. So it's like, I didn't want to have the scar. I didn't want to look different than other people, but there's a level of that you got to get to where you're like, I am just really interested in being myself. That's what I'm really interested in. And I'm interested in, hey, man, it's like, because because the more you accept you, other yeah. people will. That's just the truth. Like, as soon as I stop worrying about my scar and doing all of this, people were like, it's almost like they didn't even see the scar. Mm-hmm. But I was walking around thinking that I was, you know, a pariah. And I was just not worthy, worthy. And, and that's how I, I started to interact with people. And people were like, you know, you're kind of off put by people who aren't confident in who they are. Even if who they are is weird, different, weird, different, whatever the case may be. So that's just one thing. So what would you say, um, how can we as a community, as women show up for our young black men? in a way that they can fully receive it. Ooh, try not to fall out your chair because I'm gonna try to get all this in. No! <laughs> okay. All right, so the first is do not treat him negative because you don't like his daddy. Okay, now the relationship didn't work out. Maybe he was no good all along but do not treat that black male child negative because you do not like the father. Mm-hmm. Also with that, don't make negative statements. You just like your daddy. Don't make statements like that because he's not just like his father. Mm-hmm. He is a young man who is developing and who is making some right choices and some wrong choices like all of us do in life. Yeah. So always speak positivity to him yeah. and into him. Um, the next thing I would say is um, be honest with him. Give him critical feedback. When he's making mm-hmm. missteps, don't be quiet and silent and say, mm-hmm. well, I saw him doing it, but I wasn't going to say nothing because you can't tell him nothing. Mm-mm. Give him critical feedback. Mm-hmm. But don't give him critical feedback at the table in front of everybody. Right? Mm-hmm. Don't give him critical feedback at the, at the, at the um, July 4th holiday picnic. Y'all, let me tell you all the stuff Tony don't do. That's not critical feedback. You're mm-hmm. embarrassing him. Mm-hmm. It's going to cause him to shut down. Critical feedback is, I'm just going to pick a place because 
on the side of your bed, you sit there, he sit right next to you, and you're having a conversation about some observable behaviors he's done mm -hmm. and some suggestions of what you would like to see him turn those behaviors around and let yeah. him respond and comment about yeah. it. And y'all have a conversation because one of the things that we want to get Black men to do and what um, sisters can really be helpful in our young Black men is to make us feel guilty when we when we're thinking of making a bad a, a mistake or a poor choice because we'll remember that conversation we had with you and when we probably in the might be a little white line or something with your friend we might want to put our nose to it we would think about that conversation that we had and be like no you know what y'all I'm, I'm here I'm gonna head home yeah. so yeah. so really I had keeping the open line of communication um, there. The other thing too is um, don't speak ill of women, right? Like, oh, Jaha, women ain't no good. They ain't gonna do nothing but take your money. They ain't about nothing. Mm. You can't, can't trust them as long as you far as you can throw them. So don't have negative conversations yeah. about your own gender because he's gonna develop negative thoughts about black women in his mind. Yeah. And, um, and that's not gonna bode well to his future relationship. Either he's gonna end up not wanting relationships with black women, period, or he's gonna have toxic relationships where he's gonna treat them as negative individuals, mm -hmm. or he may develop a disinterest in women all together and start seeking other genders. So there's so many things that can happen from having negative conversations comments yeah. about women or she looked like a hoochie and all those kind of things so in short i want to say love on on black men mm -hmm. give them critical feedback and mm -hmm. keep an open line of communication and stay loving oh i am so grateful that sounds like a wonderful recipe for a wonderful relationship with your young black son, your nephew, or, you know, I think even with anybody that that is applicable, what I will say and encourage women to do mm -hmm. is a lot of times when you feel so much pressure, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the pressure that you're feeling you're like, this could be, if if the dad stayed, I wouldn't be going through this. That's where, you know what I'm saying? If, if this didn't happen, I wouldn't be going through this. This is hard. It's hard for a woman because you're emotionally having to deal with things and you may not feel the support or feel safe mm -hmm. because men represent, you know, safety a lot of times. Unless a woman's been traumatized. And a lot of times women have been traumatized by men. So the man doesn't represent safety. And there's a lot of fear associated. So I say this to say that a way to even make it possibly easier for a woman to be able to speak with her son or her, you know, any black man, young black man in her life is to, to get help get assistance, whether it's assistance through therapy Absolutely. or it's, it's, hey, I'm gonna call in some uncles, some cousins, some male cousins, you know what I'm saying? I need you to help me. Mm -hmm. This, this idea of black women are strong. We can do everything, child. Mm -hmm. No. Right. Even if you could do everything, doing everything is not necessarily going to be for your own benefit. And I encourage women, generally speaking, to be a little bit more selfish, not selfish in a mean, terrible way, but in a way where you're really able to take better care of yourself so that you can nurture and be more in your feminine energy so that you can take better care of those who are under your care. So get the help, the resources, organizations, whatever you got to do, enroll people in this situation so you don't have to feel alone. So you're not having to juggle everything alone because it's hard to speak lovely, beautiful, encouraging things. And you feel like the light's about to get cut off. Y'all about to get kicked out of the apartment. You, your job just laid you off. Like all this stuff is happening. You feel like the world is crumbling. Okay. So I just encourage women to reach out. Don't, don't go fall for this super black woman trope. Then I got to be this way. Nope. Get the help that you need mm -hmm. because your child deserves the love that you know, 
everything that you can and you want to love your child, of course. Who doesn't, you know, desire that? But sometimes you got some scars in the way. We got to get those scars out the way so it makes it that much easier. So I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of this. This is amazing. Is there anything else that you wanted to share? Um, I didn't think so, but after you just spoke, I, I did get encouraged for a couple of things. Okay. I want uh, to, to the mothers as well, is that um, it is so okay to cry. It is so okay to cry. I think trying to hold everything in, uh, you know, as Ms. Bryant said, when you have electric bills and, and car notes and, and, and your own health uh, and family stuff, people dying, like it's just life happens. Definitely, please don't hold it in and cry. I mean, one of the very sad things I saw probably about six months ago uh, was a woman who had a, um, a, a semi-newborn. I think the baby was maybe about two or three months old, but she held the baby to her chest and jumped off of a bridge, black woman. Yep, mm -hmm. and, and, and both of them died. I mean, to me, it, she she probably fits what we're talking about. She probably has so much going on, felt she didn't have anybody to talk to. And, and I think a couple things too is um, don't like talk out loud to yourself, like really think like you're talking to somebody, but have internal conversations with yourself too, because sometimes we don't do that. We seek and let me go talk to my, my home girl. Let me see what she think I should do. Kind of talk to yourself too sometimes and do some reflection. Like, is this decision that I'm about to make for my son the best interest for him, for me? Like kind of kind of ask yourself what I call is the Oprah phenomenon. Ask them good questions. Yes, <laughs> good, good questions. <laughs> good, questions. <laughs> good questions. No, that's real. Because your brain is going to look for the answers. And it's you, if you ask bad, because I used to ask myself bad questions. Why does this have to happen to me? Why, why did, it, you know, because, and then you like, why did this happen to me? Well, the answer could be, well, you shouldn't have been messing around at 18 months old, pulling cups of coffee on yourself. Oh, well, maybe if they, they would have done that, you're going to find some horrible answers. Like, why does stuff never work out for me? You're going to find the answer for that. But if you say, how can this situation serve me? How can I make the most out of this situation? You're going to get some answers you never would have thought of. So I'm so glad you said that. All right, let me be quiet. That, that no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I, I love it. I think I got about nine more minutes before you talk, cut me off, cut us off. So we'll keep going. I oh, love no, it. Oh, no, it's all good. The, um, yeah, and I think, I think the other thing, too, is I want sisters to be so critical of themselves, too. Like, yeah. You don't make mistakes because you're human. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, going back to what Ms. Bryan said, never try to strive to be super mom, to appear you always okay and calm and everything's okay. But you do want to be critical when you have made mistakes. Apologize to your son. Don't, don't feel like what I have seen uh, some uh, Black women do is the apology comes to move it on with the conference. So what you want for dinner? Like, so, so if you know you don't made a mistake, apologize to him because yeah. that's strength in that. If he sees, mm -hmm. wow, mom has been lightning into me for three days over something she think I did. Then she got some new data to find yeah. out I didn't do what she thought I did. Yep. And she actually said, baby, I'm so sorry. Mama made a mistake. I thought, I thought you did it. Please forgive me. That, that matter, that would matter to him. Um, so never just kind of move on in the discussion and pretend, and that's in all your relationships, sisters, and not just with your son. Now, if you're mm -hmm. wrong, go ahead and make an apology. Yeah. Right? You know, it might feel hard, like he's going to kill you and you're going to die if you apologize to somebody, <laughs> but you're not. So go ahead and apologize uh, when you uh, make mistakes and, and be, uh, no, Ooh, well, I cry if I deliver this, <laughs> be honest with everybody on how you want to be treated. Oh, don't, don't expect that your son should know how to treat you. I'm your mama, you should know how to treat me. Or if you're dating somebody, communicate your expectations mm -hmm. of what treatment to you looks like and what you expect from it. And when I say talk about it, don't talk about it in an adversarial way. Don't be like, cause let me tell you what Miss Shanique was gonna go for and what she ain't gonna go for. Don't do it that way. I want you to be very calm and say, these are the things that, that, that Shantia likes for her. She likes to feel love. Mm -hmm. She likes to feel nurtured. She likes open communication. She mm -hmm. likes to, so, so just be very calm because how you present stuff, cut people off from listening or not listening all the time. You could be saying the most amazing thing, but if you say it out of a place of anger or sassiness, it's not gonna always be received in the spirit and intent 
that you want it to be. And the other thing I'm going to say about your son, I'm going to um, shift it over because I'm not the moderator. I'm up here carrying on like I am. So I'm sorry. Is that um, saying to him, you need to talk to him about um, the expectations of how you want him to be treated, but also you have expectations of him and what that looks like. Because sometimes sons find out after punitive, right? He done did something um. and he's and yelling at him, but you never told him before that what the expectations are. So communicate expectations because guess what? We do a good job. A lot of us do a good job on that at work, right? We talk about, okay, what are the expectations of this job? Because I don't want to get written up. I want you to be just like that with your son. Communicate expectations up front. So that when it comes to evaluation time and six months of his behavior in the household, mm-hmm. good to go, right? But you don't like go, her, you know, on him real hard, but you never told him what you expected from things. And that's so many. I'm talking about your expectations of communication, your expectation of how to express love. Like it's so many things to uh, talk about. And whether it's one child or you got a house of six or seven, that's yeah. even more of a reason for you to be organized and over communicate so everybody's clear. Wow. I love that. That's real. Because it's interesting because that honestly, that that's just discipline. And you're open and honest about you and what you need and all of that. Man, shoot. And then if somebody is not trying to fall in line with that, like you said, that's when, okay, hashtag problems. There it is. And you already know it's going to be some, some repercussions. That's it. And so that, things, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, one of the things you see on television all the time is the person who on the witness stand always get upset when the truth start coming out. Mm. And they cross-examine. They say, well, this is what you were told. This was the time frame you were told it. This is what you did. And then when the lawyer talked very calmly to them, that's when they get all shook. I don't know. They start breaking down all that stuff yeah. because they were communicating the expectations in advance. Yeah. They had time to make the right choice. They still made the wrong choice and then not being called on the carpet. But you want to do that process so that oftentimes you don't get to that fourth step where yeah. they will make a right choice and not have to get called on the carpet. Oh, hashtag problems. <laughs> right. Okay. This was amazing. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much for being a part of this show and for sharing your experience and so many powerful tips. My goodness. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And whew, I hope everybody was listening. I have to take some notes on this one. Okay. I got to take some notes. Okay. So All right. Brian with Baby I Got Scars. She <laughs> is amazing, folks. Please follow her on Facebook. Follow her on YouTube. Yes. She's doing how amazing can, work. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Now, how can people get in touch with you? I want people to get in touch with you right now. They're like, look, right, folks, get so on the game. This, I'm going to go to me, then I'm going to go back to her. All right. So me, you can um, reach out to me. I'm on all the platforms. I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on um, LinkedIn. Uh, so it's Dr. Tony D. Johnson. You type the whole name, you'll be able to follow me. Uh, my company, Captivate Perspectives, as well as on all the social media um, platforms. Uh, feel free to inbox me. Uh, send me an a, a uh, invite uh, to, to friend. I would love to uh, connect with you all. Now, going back to the queen, y'all. Yeah. So Ms. Bryant is amazing. Uh, please follow her. She has done some amazing things in the fine and performing arts space. Uh, she's doing some great things for our community and, and in the media. And I think it's so critically important that we support the great work of sisters like her um, because when she's in Hollywood walking that, that red carpet and stuff and getting those awards and stuff and on those yachts, we want to say that's right, sister, you deserve it because you have done really hard work. So let's please stand behind her in her great work. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate you. Aww. My pleasure.